it's enough time for the doctor to walk to my mom and say, your daughter is dead, and my mom says, no way, go back. Go back and try and wake her up, do whatever it takes. I couldn't sleep at night because I thought I won't wake up. What if I, I die again? So I was a mess. I'm not the kind of woman who you would hit and then I go, ah, no. I was fighting back. I was physical with him as well. I didn't allow him to beat me and throw me down the stairs and I just watch him and no. My marriage was never a fairy tale. Even in the girlfriend and boyfriend stage, it was never a fairy tale. The only reason I got married was because I'm pregnant and he wanted to marry me. The person Makhadi was getting married to is somebody I went to high school with. He is it's primary school and high school. He is actually my younger brother's friend. So he's younger than me. And I've always seen him as this, ah, my younger brother's friend. So when it was time to kiss the bride, yo. Anyway, how are you? I'm good, just as I'm good. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Um, I'm just a little nervous. I never get nervous with interviews. But today I'm nervous. How come you're nervous? We... Because of the questions you ask. Pilawena, you seem to dig deep, like... Serious? Yes, your questions <laughs> are quite um, provocative, you know, th thought-provoking. If you don't know your story, <laughs> yeah, yeah. don't sit in front of justice. It's, uh, you, you will be thrown off, you know. So I guess at the end of the day, I'm just telling myself, ah, no, no, just go there and... He will probably ask you something about you, so you know you, you know your story, right? Yeah. Even though I did a little bit of a research here and there, so I can be chronologically correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. I always try to uh, make people to want to know the other side of a person, you know? Mm. Uh, something that people don't normally know. Yeah. Well, that's why you dig so deep. Yeah, I tr well, I try. I don't. Uh, I, well, I've got my line. Like, I, I'm not supposed to jump on the other side uh -huh. because people might end up saying some family stuff and whatever that they dealing with. Or so, I, I wish I had like some sort of therapist in the background, and <laughs> you know, so <laughs> something like that. Anyway, <laughs> tell me about your kids. How is it like raising? You have two kids, right? Yes, two, two. two. My gosh, three. Yes, actually you can say three. I have an adopted kid. I'm sure. <laughs> I have an adopted kid, but she's old now. She's in tertiary, so. Yeah. Yeah. I just took her under my wing while she was in high school, but I guess you could say three, yeah. <laughs> but the ones that come from me, from my body, from yeah. my womb, are two kids, two girls. Yeah. Yeah, extensions of me. When you look at how you're raising your kids, do you think it's, it's similar to how you were also raised in a way? No, totally different. Yeah, totally different. Absolutely right? different. I do not raise my kids the way I was raised. Yeah. Sometimes my mom even gets shocked, you know, she was here for the December holidays and the way they have such freedom in the house, my mother doesn't get it sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. And I only say, a house is for expression, it's not for impression. Mm -hmm. So you don't come home to impress who? You can't live in a clean house as if people don't live there or got it's a hotel. You, sometimes it's okay to leave your shoes there. You'll pick them up in the evening and take them to the bedroom. Mm. You know, you don't have to live in a squeaky clean house like you're even afraid to put your feet on the couch. Mm. You know, so a house is for expression. Express who you really are, not impressing visitors. Mm. You understand what I mean? That's mm. one of my rules, you know. So since I'm talking about my family, can I take these off? Thank you. By the way, you look stunning. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I dressed up for, you know, I take you guys seriously, so I thought, you know what, you better also look serious. Mm. You know, don't underestimate people's work and crafts. For somebody who doesn't know like myself, how was it growing up in the family that you grew up in? Ooh, um, you know, I come from your typical black family. When I say typical, I'd say... Uh, both parents are civil servants, you know, teachers. And, uh, um, you know, they were both just, well, trying their level best to create a home for us, right? Um, in society, from a bystander, you would think we're a typical family, typical black family. Parents are teachers, kids are going to Model C schools, they're living in the suburbs. They're really trying to 
you know, live a life of what we call middle class society. But when you get into it and you put on your magnifying glass, you will see that there's quite a lot of things that are not balanced. You know, um, I have a mother and a dad who lived under the same roof, but my mother carried both roles by herself um, as the matriarch and also the patriarch of the family financially, um, you know, in raising us as well, instilling values. So as far as I remember, I was raised by my mom. Uh, my dad was just there by name. <laughs> and when I say by name, I mean he was there every day, but um, we don't talk, we don't have any lessons from, from him. Instead, my dad was like somebody we took care of, you know. Um, my dad had his own issues. Um, he struggles with substance abuse. But I say struggle, to put it lightly, he doesn't see it as a, as a problem. And you know, if you don't see something as a problem, you'll never fix it, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, I always say, it's one thing to have a father that left and you don't know your father and your father left and probably started another family somewhere. It's one thing to have a father's presence in the house, but that father was never really present emotionally, psychologically, mm. financially. Yeah. I don't know what it feels like to run to my dad and cry and say so-and-so did this and this to me. I don't know. I don't know any of that. So a father figure to me never really existed. I don't have anybody I look up to as a father figure, aside from Abba Father, our Heavenly Father. Huh. Yeah. Um, just to add on a, a little bit to that, um, that kind of an environment afforded me to have quite a close relationship with my siblings. Um, we have a hero complex towards each other. We want to always be there for each other. Like, we may not be there for each other for the mundane things, but... We always save each other in the midst of problems. Like, I will kill the bull for you. I got your back. What do you want me to do? I'll give you my last cent to go to that interview. We always have each other's back because we didn't grow up in an environment that um, was, you know, comfortable, you know. And if there's one thing that we all agree on as the three siblings, me being the firstborn uh, only girl amongst two younger boy siblings, we always had this. So um, you guys are f we three. We three, okay. So I'm the firstborn. I'm the only girl to two younger boys. And if there's one thing we all, we collect we collectively agree on is that um, we gotta take care of this woman, our mom that has raised us. Um, hard, it, sometimes it was hard for her. Most of the time it was hard for her. But uh, we all wanna just make her proud. And we are taking care of her now. We want to take care of her in a way of just thanking her for the sacrifices she made to raise us within the situation and the marriage that she was in. She still showed up for us, you know. So everything that happened in your life outside of your home, um, whether you've been bullied or anything else, you would come back home and just directly speak to your mom. Oh, no, 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 no. My mom, my mom is not a person who just allows uh, one to... I'm trying to find a proper way to put it. I like to call her a tough lover. My mom mm -hmm. is a tough lover. Um, you can't run to my mom and cry. She's going to say, toughen up. Mm. Toughen up. Pull up your socks. Do what you got to do to solve the situation. She does not have time for crying. My mom doesn't have time for crying. She's a tough lover. She instilled the rules. Um, she still believes in the notion of you spare the rod, you spoil the child, you know. Um, and I think that's how I got to accept her love. In the beginning, it was kind of confusing. Oh, this woman doesn't love me, you know. She's too, she's too tough, man. I cannot even cry to her as a girl about certain insecurities or, you know, bullying at school. But I think that's just her way, her method of raising us. She wanted us to be tough because the world is tough, you know. I'm only starting to talk to her intimately now in my adulthood wow. because she maybe sees me as a, you know, I'm on her level. I'm a parent as well now, you know, yeah, so. Yeah. Hence why I said, I don't raise my kids the way my mom raised me. I give my kids space to, to speak openly because 
I don't want them to run to somebody else to talk to when they have a mom at home. Mm. So my mom never really allowed, yes, that's what I'm looking for. My mom mm. never really allowed vulnerability. Mm. That's my mom. And I think it's just the generation that they come from. Vulnerability is viewed as weakness. Mm. You're weak. Why, why must you feel bad, Hore? When you are perceived this way, prove them wrong, excel at something else, you know. So that that's just that generation, and you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? Hundred percent. Yeah. So your mom gave you all the support. Did she, like any other mom, tell you that yo, you need to go to school? Oh yeah. <laughs> in my family, there was no room for failure in academics. She's a teacher. And a firm one at that. So I think my good grades in high school, are, I give credit to my mom. Yeah. She is the kind of parent who stays up with you during exam season. She stays up with you and cross nights with you and writes tests for you. Wow. Yeah. And you won't go to bed until you answer that test and get 100%. During uh, our final years of matric, each one of us, my mom would take us to her office or book us out to um, maybe a hotel room somewhere and sit with you to study because it's matric. She wants you to pass well. Because at home there was always that um, turmoil, that there was always that instability. My dad might just erupt into her, into his violent outbursts, you know, um, when he's under the influence of alcohol. So my mother, my mother never wanted us to be, um, you know, distracted. So she would always find a way to put us in a, take us out of the home and put us in a quiet space to study just so she can guarantee a good pass in matric. And if you've got a good pass in matric, you're obviously going to a good university, you know? And uh, she didn't stop right after matric, as a matter of fact. Yeah. She made sure that all three of us graduate. Mm -hmm. We were not allowed to be dropouts at all. Wow. That's my alarm. For prayer. <laughs> um, let me pray. Let me see. I, you, you are being exposed. You're praying at, uh, okay. I mean, not safe. Every three hours. Every, oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's, it's, that's it's, um, it's January. Don't you do the January 21 day? Oh, 21 day fasting? Yes. Um, <laughs> let me wait for you. Sorry about that. Okay. Let me switch it off in case. Um, no, but it's on flight mode. That was just the alarm. The next one will be, will be done. Yeah, no stress. Thank you so much. I don't, I don't do the 21 day fasting. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's very effective. I actually do it before. Oh, yeah. In December. In December. Wow. Yeah. Must take a lot of discipline. Hey? Yeah. I do it. No, before. um, it's just the, it's the tradition in my home. I don't belong to a particular church, but my mother and I do it. And my brothers don't participate, but my mom and I have been doing it for years. Okay. Um, that's why on the 31st, you can never find me at a party. Because I'm always at home, pray, you know. Mm, yeah. so we do start it before Jen, but then when people start theirs in Jen, they usually do it for detoxing, right? Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. Yeah, so I was. Wait, wait, detoxing from what? From December. From December. Ah, ah. <laughs> Most well, people are. I didn't know. Yes, Jeez, yes. Wow. no, no, no. It's it's all over social media now. It's a thing now, right? Oh. So people, I can see they say, "Oh, let's start the twenty-one day fasting." Intermediate fasting, they call it. And that for them is to detox from groove, the beverages that you were drinking, and the weight that you've gained over December holidays. Because all we do is eat, eat, eat. Yeah. You yeah, know? Come a little bit close. Um, yeah. We always eat, and we, we have like your choice of sauteed, yeah. several kalasi. So I think people are doing it to just reduce the fat they gained over the festive season. But um, I do it for spiritual reasons, so of course, just to be in alignment and understand who do I need to be in this season that I'm stepping into, wow. you know? Yeah. And just also pray over your goals, man. You can't just write goals down and then you don't pray about them. Who's going to help you fulfill them? You know what I mean? Speaking affirmations. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So when you were in uh, grade 12, you probably had a goal, you know, that you wanted to achieve. I know you from Skim Sam as an actor. Um, it's it's so shocking that I actually found out that you studied psychology, yeah. and that blew my mind. 
and I also found out that uh, you stayed in the U.S. Yeah. for like four years. That blew my mind. I didn't know. I thought you were one of those actors. No, no, no beef to anybody who came out from the from home and, and then they just got a role and then they just acted without even knowing that in the background you actually did so much. Yeah. What was your plan? What was your goal when you were in grade 12? <laughs> so, uh, like I said, I come from a family with uh, both parents as teachers, yeah. but my mother was the pushy one who didn't want her children to be, um, you know, non-academics or overachievers because she had this notion that I'm a teacher, my kids must just be as good in school. You know? yeah. And so um, I was quite good in school. Um, I would say an A student because then before we had maths literature, there was higher grade maths and higher grade science. And, and, and. so in high school, I did your science, your maths, your biology subjects mm -hmm. because the goal was to be a doctor. Wow. Yeah, I... Uh, I just, I'm fascinated about the human anatomy. And um, I've always thought being a doctor, and I wasn't even thinking about the finances of it. I just, I'm fascinated about cutting up a body and finding out about human parts and how they work. Wow. Yeah, and I'm not grossed out by blood. I'm not squirmish. Serious? Yeah. Wow, yeah, great. so, um, but then when I heard that doctors study for seven years, and then after seven years, they, on Christmas and New Year's, they are working. I'm like, hell no. <laughs> I want a holiday. I don't go to school for so many years to not relax. It didn't make sense to me, right? So um, I guess that was me just trying to say, I've, I've worked so hard in high school. I really don't want to work that hard anymore. I want something that will, I'm happy to do. So the next option from uh, being a doctor was radiography, radiology. Um, but I just didn't find it fascinating at all. But I found something interesting in psychology. Reason being, psychology is the study of human behavior, but human behavior stems from the mind, right? So your actions, your behavior are influenced by your mind, your thoughts, your emotions. And I thought if I can study how the brain works, neurology was obviously the next option as well, but you study for a very long time. So I thought, you know, let me actually step into psychology. Let me actually understand how the human mind works, right? And psychology is still a, a field where you work with human beings. I've always wanted to do something that you help people. I wanted to help people. So technology is not anything I'm interested in. Engineering, don't call me into that field. I don't care how the mic works. I just want it to work. Okay, so um, you can understand that my line of work was always to work with people. So I went for, I opted for psychology. However, things took a turn. After graduating, um, I wanted to partake in this um, student exchange program uh, called OPE in America, where you can go live, work, and study there. And uh, you get to live with an American family. Or pay is just a fancy word for nanny. So you're taking care of their kids. You're like the tutor, you know. As they, you take them to school, you bring them back. You help them with homework, so on and so forth. And, you know, I, I thought, I can do that. I've always been taking care of my brothers. So this is nothing new to me. The only thing you had to attain was a driver's license, do some CPR training, driver's first license, aid training, side. this side. Oh. Yeah, so before you get it, can you be enrolled in the program, you have to have a driver's license because you will be driving the kids around that side. You need to have uh, first aid training, CPR, so that if anything happens, you know how to act, right, in the moment of emergency. And I accumulated all of those. And then you wait until the right family chooses you. And what I mean by that is the family that aligns with your interests, right? Say you like the city life, you like the fast life, um, then you'd be picked by a family that's in New York, in Chicago, in LA. Then if you like the country life, then you'll be f uh, picked by a family that's maybe in Oklahoma or Ohio with these plots of land, you know? And I was picked luckily by a family in New York City, Manhattan, in a, in a little uh, section of Manhattan called Chelsea. And the family was made up of uh, fashion designers, the mother and the father. And they had two younger boys that I had to take care of. 
So you can see it was not that much of a transition for me. However, before that happened, Justice, was that it took me six months before I can be picked by a family. So within the six months, I was home after graduate, after finishing matric, I was home. My, most of my friends had gone to tertiary. In the June holidays, when they came back from tertiary, uh, the June holidays, um, I remember my mom was like, I don't, I want to have any child of mine staying at home when she's got good grades and she passed so well with distinctions, you are going to school. I'm like, but mom, I want to do this. She says, well, the year, the half of the year is already gone. So you wasted half of the year of your educational life. Did my mom enroll me in Turkhoff's in Bloemfontein to go study mechanical engineering? Behind my back. I don't even know when she did all of that because I'm in the same household as you. Literally, on a Sunday night, I come back from evening service at church and she tells me, pack, you're leaving tomorrow, here's a bus ticket. To where? To Bloem. Where am I going to live? Don't worry, we've set out accommodation. We've enrolled you in this. You're studying mechanical engineering. I told you I don't want to know how machines work. I'm not a geek on technology. I'm not interested. But she enrolled me in that because that was the only thing that she could, that would accept me media. And I was in school and I learned about binary codes and stuff and I hated every minute of it. <laughs> and it just so happens that by the September holidays, the family that wanted me contacted us. And she said, well, what are you gonna do? You're in school studying. Are you? I'm like, of course I'm dropping out. I'm going to America. Who, where do you ever get a chance like that? I'm going. And I dropped out of mechanical engineering. And um, I remember I landed in the States on my 19th birthday in 2004. So yeah, I left South Africa on the 8th of November and I land, on the 7th of November and I landed on the 8th. But because the program requires you to go to school as well. Um, it's part of the deal that the American embassy made with the South African government. You can't just go there to work. You have to go to school part-time. Mm -hmm. And that's where I chose psychology. That's where I started. Wow. Yeah, so I was studying psychology at a borough of Manhattan Community College. And when I relocated back to South Africa, I just took the credits and I just used them at UNISA and continued with psychology. How come you don't, like you never... Have an accent? Yeah, like... Um... It's there. If I want to bring it out, I can. You know what I'm saying? It's hidden, you know? Uh, it's just that sometimes I just don't think people understand me. As most date to me. Because South Africa, nobody wants to hear an accent. Obviously, like obviously. A lot of South Africans, they're bashing people that are going to the States. I mean, I, back with I've been back for over 10 years, guys. The accent has dissolved, you know what I'm saying? Uh, my best friend still lives there. Okay. And when she's back this side, the accent switches back to this side. You know, it's a South African accent. As soon as she lands. As soon as she lands. I think it's something you tell yourself. Honestly, the accent thing is just the hoax. Really, you can switch it up. We know you can. You just don't want to. <laughs> you just you just switch up on us. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So you come back from the U.S., come back to South Africa. Um, do you start auditioning or do you enroll in something else? Okay. So um, since I was already used to earning a salary from a young age, yeah. um, I had the option to either go to school full time. I've always wanted to go to UCT. So my mom said, well, don't you want to continue psychology at UCT? My problem was I, do, I was not comfortable with the idea of not earning a salary because uh, from the age of 19, I'm earning $300 a week. And back then the rent to the dollar was 1000 So per week I was earning 3000 from the age of 19. Obviously, I didn't know what to do with the money, so I just always sent it back to South Africa for my mom to do with it as she pleases because she was uh, living as a single parent, right? Financially, she did not have help from my dad, so I always used to just send the money back home. But upon returning, I knew I wouldn't be comfortable 
going to school and not earning and not having my own income and financial independence. So I opted for working. And because UNISA, you can part-time study there, I decided, let me enroll in UNISA instead. So that's how I ended up in UNISA. And um, I worked at, I first worked at APSA Bank as a um, outside sales representatives where I'd go to remote areas to help people open bank accounts. And then I got an opportunity to go work for the same company that took me overseas. I got an opportunity to work in the regional office of Pretoria. And eventually I moved to the regional office of Gauteng and their offices was in UJ. UJ had UJ FM right next to the office that I was so working So everything in. is literally linked together. Yeah, yeah, so what people don't know is that I started radio when I was living in America. Um, I used to hang out in Harlem a lot because I was living in Manhattan, the island, right, yeah. New York City. So I used to hang out in Harlem because Harlem um, has a lot of Africans in it. So whenever I would feel homesick, I would go to Harlem and go to those flea markets and mix with Africans from different parts of Africa. Once in a while, you would bump into a South African, but mostly I would bump into your Kenyans, your uh, Zimbabweans, and so on and so forth. So one day I was in the flea market, and I think I was inquiring about something, and a, and a tall gentleman by the name of Shaka, um, one day he might probably pass, come across this podcast, and yeah. that's why I'm mentioning his name. He And I remember just hearing a voice behind me saying, You've got a lovely voice. Would you like to be on radio? And I'm like, hello, sorry, excuse me. But you've got a lovely voice. Have you been on radio before? I'm like, no. Would you like to be on radio? I'm like, I don't know anything about radio. Yeah. He said, no, of course we'll train you. So um, Shaka worked for the Salvation Army, which is like a, a community center uh, to help disadvantaged people. And the Salvation Army had a community radio station in Harlem for Africans. So you in that radio station, you get a, 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 a presenter from di a different part of Africa. And this is how you could hear music from back home, right? So um, I was supposed to represent South Africa, of course, in that particular radio station. They already had a Zimbabwean um, presenter, but he didn't have much music from South Africa. And obviously then I then just started introducing um, South African music to the African diaspora yeah. of Harlem. I remember one of the interviews I had on that radio show was WHP, telephonically. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. A friend of mine who knows him connected us, and I did an um, interview with him telephonically. And that's how the radio bug bit me, right? That was the, and they say, once you do radio, you can never step out of it. You just, yeah. You've got a relationship with the mic. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And I then learned that, you know, I could do this thing in my sleep, right? I had that arrogance. So now fast forward, I'm at UJ. I'm working in the regional manager's office of OPE. Next door is UJ FM. I walk in there in confidence. I'm like, I want to work here. I used to be on radio. And the question was, who are you? What skills do you have? What experience do you have? I'm like, I used to work on, on a radio station in America. We don't know that radio station. How can we trust that you have skills? And I was crushed. And I thought, damn, okay, I thought I was a somebody. But guess what? Because I loved it so much, because I never want to be a one-hit wonder, because I'm one person who wants to, if the world doesn't qualify me, I want to qualify myself. And how do I do that? I enhance my skills. I actually enrolled while studying psychology, while working as a regional manager, I enrolled at a school called On Cue Communications. I don't know if it's still available to this day. Um, and uh, they had like radio presenting and production classes. So it was a six month course that you could take. And I took it. And, uh, and in that class, I remember I was in the same group of people with Zizo Beda, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's when I met her. And, you know, we, we, we were trained in the art of radio, that radio is theater of the mind. 
what you say in those three minutes between songs has to have an impact. If you're not a good storyteller, you can't do radio. You have to be a social commentator. Be an observer of life and be able to come and talk about it and share your opinions. But you can't always be right. You must always invite other opinions. You know, we were taught so many things about radio, how to also operate the table as well. You know, because talking and operating a table at the same time is quite a skill to adapt. When I got that qualification, I went back to the same people that turned me down and I showed them that qualification and I got a show. Wow. Yeah. And um, I didn't even work on that show too long uh, because three months time, Capricorn FM, which is one of the biggest radio stations in Limpopo, yeah. uh, reached out to me to come and work uh, on the drive time show. Wow. And that's how I left corporate and got into radio. Yeah. So I would, I would believe I've been doing radio for more than 10 years. I just took a break for seven years because I cheated on radio with acting. So how did that like link together in a way from radio to acting? Yeah. Yeah. So I, after working on Capricorn, okay, I worked on Capricorn FM for a year. And then uh, after that, towards the end of that year, I fell pregnant with my first child. And um, uh, I guess... I took a break. Let me put it that way. I took a break. From everything, basically. No, no, from radio. Okay. Yeah, I took a break. But if you really want to know what I, why I took the break, that's in the book, so I'll leave it. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'll leave it there. Yeah. I took a break, um, and then I gave birth to my daughter, but I didn't want to go back to the same radio station after giving birth to my daughter. So in that time, I decided to uh, push my psychology degree so that I can get further. Because remember, I'm still doing it part-time. And if you're doing it part-time, you usually don't finish it within the four years that you should finish it. If you were in school full-time, you'd finish it in a year, in four years. Yeah. But then I was doing it part-time. So I thought, let me use this time at home to push school and go further. Because I always finish what I started. I cannot just leave psychology hanging in the air. I want to get that degree. And... Um, when I wanted to start off fresh after some turmoil and trials and tribulations, I moved back to Joburg. And when I moved back to Joburg, um, I couldn't go back into radio right away. Mm. So what happened is I found any kind of a job. I went, I went back to working at a telemarketing communication center. Yeah, I was those people that would call and say, hey, ma'am, I'd like to introduce you to the new insurance company, da, 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 you know. That's why when they call me today, I give them a chance to talk because I was that person on the other side, you know. We, we don't give them a chance. I do, I do. <laughs> Just up, like, really? I give them a chance. I was that person. I know how it feels like. So um, while I was working there, though, um, because, you know, you create a network of people along the way in life. A friend of mine who I worked with at Capricorn FM said, hey, there's a radio station that the Department of International Relations and Communications has started. Um, it's called Ubuntu Radio. Don't you want to come work there? I'm like, hell yeah. And then I started working there. So I didn't work as a telemarketer for too long. And then I got the job at Ubuntu Radio. I worked at Ubuntu Radio until it was dissolved for a while due to, I don't know, corruption or tender issues. Then I didn't have a job for a while. And then I got the opportunity to work on Impact Radio. Okay. When I worked on Impact Radio, Impact Radio is a, a Christian radio station uh, in Pretoria. And in Impact Radio, I remember I was working with um, um, one of the ladies that uh, I ended up working with at Skim Sum. But anyway, I'll connect the dots. I worked in Impact Radio from Impact Radio, um, I remember one day I saw an advert on Facebook saying that there are auditions at Skim Sum. Oh. Uh, Skim Sum auditions in Hamanskrai. And well, I'm from Hamanskrai. How come I did How about them? <laughs> so that was when? That was back in 2014. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So they had auditions in Joburg and in Hamanskrai. I knew very well that Why the auditions. Um, Kemba. Some building, I think they're, they're, they're government buildings. So it, it looked like a school. My and it's n- it's not even before you get to the main road, Yahamans Kral, as soon as you off ramp, before you get to that KFC. On the left? E- on the right. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I think it's Mandela Hall or something. Yes. N- n- when you, well, before you get to the KFC, yes. you can see the Mandela statue there. Yes. Around that area. So it, that's why I'm saying it looked like a government institution. Yeah. So um, I knew that YouTuber could be full, man. Why must I call you? 
auditions in Joburg. So, and also I was going with um, a cousin of mine who had been in the acting industry all along. So I thought, oh, let's go, you know, and I'm also going to get pictures with other characters from Skim Sam, you know. And I loved Skim Sam because it's from, it's a it's a Sibedi drama. So I felt like I own it, you know. I felt like it's our thing to be proud of, you know, here in Joburg. And I knew certain characters as well. You know, your my, my co-star on Skim Sam is somebody I went to school with. <laughs> yeah, so it's people I know. And I thought, mm, let me go and take pictures as well. When I got there, um, I remember one of the people who was uh, giving us our numbers said to me, why don't you audition? I'm like, yeah, I'm here to get pictures, you know. That's cool. I'm just here to get pictures. He said, no, audition, I'm, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know anything about acting. And he said, put together a monologue. And I don't know what a monologue is, but me being me, I went and Googled, put together a monologue, I translated it in Sibedi and auditioned. And I just thought nothing of it because I was hella funny. <laughs> I just, I went there to have fun. I went there to have fun. And two weeks later, I get a phone call. And guess what? The phone call was that the auditions, they had different characters you were auditioning for. So you could pick what you were auditioning for. But this particular character that I was called in for was not up for auditions that day. It was not a character. They were still coming up with the character. There was probably going to be, they were probably going to do close auditions. I don't know. But two weeks later, I got a call. Listen, we are considering you for a role called Mahadi. She's going to be a journalist and inter uh, she's going to be interviewing Lieto. It's just a short cameo role, you know. It's just like three, three scenes, you know. So you'll probably be shooting like three days and then that's it. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, will I get a little bit of training because I don't know anything? So don't worry, don't worry, we, we, we got you. I can you work on radio. I'm like, yes, I work on radio. Yes, she's a journalist. So you, you will pick up a few things. It will be easy for you. Mind you, I'm not a journalist. Ne? I'm, not a <laughs> <laughs> I'm a psychology student. <laughs> It just happened that. But I just happened to work yeah, on radio, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. And but uh, that worked for you. Yeah. But also because I qualified myself. Remember, I went to on cue communications, so I learned journalistic uh, rules and ways of doing things. You know, credit your your source and so on and so forth. And um, <laughs> I, I remember when I went there the first day for a fitting and screen tests, they loved me, and I did my cameo role, three cameo roles, and I thought that's it. That my that was my few minutes of fame. However, I was working in Impact Radio, remember, at the time. When I told the bosses there that I'm going for an, um, to do three scenes at Skim Sam, can I get these days off? They said, no. No, you can't. Uh, this is the job. You've only been working here for a few months and already you're asking for an off. You have to make a choice. I think also it was the, um, the element that it's a Christian radio station so the role that I'll be, though, like I think in that I'm gonna I'm gonna try and defend them, right? Okay. Because I also still don't know their reason for not allowing me. But I think it had to do with the fact that the role you're gonna play might jeopardize your integrity, and this is a Christian radio station. Oh, you understand okay. what I mean? Yeah. So you are a Christian radio station presenter. Your integrity matters here your uh, presence and your character in public eye matters. So they were not sure if the role I'll be playing can still, won't dent my, my, my reputation as a Christian radio station presenter. But I remember thinking, I remember telling my mom, mom, I can't let go of this opportunity. I'll hate myself for the rest of my life for not taking this opportunity. I know it's just three scenes, but I want to do it. And they called me. They, they, they reached out to me. Not everybody gets that. People stand in queues 10 times before they get a role. I'm taking it. And I didn't know where my next job was going to come from. I took that role. And um, the following year, I sat at home for like three months not working. And then after three months, Kim Sam called me and they said, listen, we actually want to make that role a lead role. And... I'm mentioning this not to brag, but I'm mentioning it to prove that, you know, certain people are called to the industry and certain people are chosen. I'm not quite sure which one I am, but I know that 
the industry always comes to find me. Um, and I, I guess then it means I'm a chosen. I'm the few that are chosen or the few that are called. I'm not oblivious to the fact that certain people go to school for these things. Their parents part with a lot of money to take them to drama school. Certain people stand in queues for months before they can get a role. And I had just had it easy. The steps were easy. I mean, the lessons were not easy. I had to learn along the way. I was crushed. I was criticized so many times because I didn't know the background. I didn't have an acting background, but I was willing to learn along the way. And the being, being crushed and being criticized along the way only helped me to build a thicker skin. You know what I'm saying? But when Skim Sam called and said, listen, um, SABC liked you and we want to make Mahadi lead role. Before you know it, I've got a job. And the industry, from being a call-time actor to being a lead actor, and what people don't understand about that is when you're a call-time actor, you only get paid when you shoot. Yeah. When you're a lead actor, even if you shoot once a month, you still get, you paid. Still get paid. Wow. So for me, that was, what? What did I do right? But I know what it was. It's the favor of God that always walks with me everywhere I go. Were you shocked with the money that you got? I was. What? I was. I was. I moved into Bedford View. I was like, Mom, bring back my child. I want to live with her. Life is good now. Bring her back. You know, put her in a great preschool. So for me, it was um, quite a blessing. It was quite a, a leap in terms of career advancement. I never thought I'd be on TV, let alone a lead actor. Before you know it, I'm one of the, I'm in the lead storyline of the first marriage at Skim Sum. Mm -hmm. You know, so SABC was suggesting a, a marriage. They haven't seen a marriage in all the seasons before. And they wanted to see a wedding and they suggested that let Mukhadi get married. And it was quite big, you know, with four directors on set. I remember we shot it for many, many days, you know? But I remember that it humbled me, that, 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 that season of my career in the acting industry humbled me because I realized that um, I'm quite blessed to have this opportunity. Uh, I shouldn't take it lightly. And to see myself advance so quickly yeah. only means that I was meant for it, right? Yeah. But I never, again, I never took it lightly. So I did take acting lessons. I had an acting coach. I consulted with veterans in the industry because I didn't want to undermine the craft that some people went to school for it. So whenever you can't just come here and think because you were lucky, as people would put it, you don't put in the work, I put in the work. I did put in the work, yeah. I remember when I shot the, the wedding, I even went vegetarian for a while just so like I can look like a a proper bride okay. with the hourglass, okay. you know. Okay. Okay. So I did, I did put in the necessary work. Um, I never wanted to undermine the craft as well. And also, man, I was just grateful that um, I had that opportunity. Not a lot of people get that opportunity. Wow. Yeah. And, and I think that's how the world gets to know me today. They know me as Mohadi uh, from Skim Sum. The time when you got married on set, yeah. was it your first time? In a wedding dress? In a wedding dress, yeah. yes. In a I, white wedding dress. I cried when I first put it on. Were you married before or no, you not got never. married at all? Uh -uh. Wow, man. It was so surreal. And I've always, from the moment I put it on, I knew that I don't know if I can beat this in my real life, hey? I don't know if I'll be able to beat this experience in my real life. Um, I'm, it's going to be a little bit difficult for me to remember how it felt because then I was Mohadi and... That's a different person. So <laughs> for me to remember how she felt means I need to tap into her. But I remember when I first put it on, I cried because you know, when you see yourself in a white dress, it's that thing out of, oh my word, I'm a beautiful bride. This is happening. I'm about to tie my life to somebody else's life, right? But the funny thing about that wedding, guys, is that the, the person Mahadi was getting married to is somebody I went to high school with. He is as primary school and high school. He is actually my younger brother's friend. So he's younger than me. And I've always seen him as this, ah, my younger brother's friend. So when it was time to kiss the bride, yo, 
Do you understand how hard it was for me to, <laughs> to be that person's wife throughout all those things? Because when it was time to, because I, I always said to my, it's not, it's not your brother's friend. It's not your high school friend. It's your on-screen husband, you know? So um, that was the only challenge. But I think that's why we had chemistry. People are not aware that we've known each other since childhood. Our parents are even friends, you know? So uh, maybe that's why it was easy for us to co-act together. Um, but I remember, man, you know, walking in the Castepe and, you know, the plane, the here comes the bride and then it's the first dance of the first dance and everybody's watching you. I thought I was going to trip on that dress and fall, you know, but... Um, it, it literally felt like a real wedding. I know, I know, I know. So um, for me, it was, it was more of a elevation to, to remind me that you are deserving of these kind of roles. You know, because you're the center of attraction at that time. And one mistake you noticed, you know, but I always have this favor on me, man, that I didn't have to bribe anybody to get that job. I didn't have to sleep anybody to get that or sleep with anybody to get that role. God gave me that role and only God can remove it when he wants to. So I never had fear that my mistakes will, uh, will make me lose that role. I never did. And that's why any criticism that came, I took it to heart because I took it as a chance to correct myself and improve, right? So, um, yeah, Mkhadi and Leto's wedding was kind of big. It was grandiose, you know, it was over the top, you know. Mm -hmm. So you, you had the wedding on screen, um, then you had the wedding in real life. Um, I'm sure you were, you were having so much confidence, like, oh, come on, I've done this before. mm, -mm. It's not the same. How? It's not the same. Um, on screen, everybody's planning things. You don't plan anything. Yours is to rock up in a dress, right? And know your lines and know the emotions that you're supposed to portray and be in the character and bring the character to life. But in real life, you're not acting, hey? In real life, it's real. This thing is happening. You're getting married, you know? And on top of that, at the time, I was five months pregnant. And you can imagine the amount of emotions I'm going through, hormonal changes. And um, it was a shotgun wedding, meaning that it happened haphazardly. It wasn't planned over months. Um, it wasn't, you know, carefully calculated. You know, it was a matter of, okay, you're pregnant. He wants to marry you, marry him, you know? And um, I remember I went and asked for our outfits on a Wednesday and the wedding was on a Saturday, on a Sunday. It was supposed to be on a Saturday, but it was the 31st of October and that's Halloween. And I was like, nope, I'll pick the 1st of November. So I started, I started planning things on the Wednesday and the wedding was on a Sunday because it took me that long to snap into it that you are getting married you know, and I didn't even expect it to be such a big event, but my family man pulled out in their numbers. They came through in numbers, man. <laughs> I don't know if it's because they never thought I'd get married because of, of the character I have, um, my personality, or is, be, is it because I'm the only girl amongst boys at home? I don't know. But my family was a lot there, man. Friends also pulled through, despite how late I told them. I told them on a Wednesday, hey guys, I'm getting married, by the way. If you can make it, thank you. If you can't, don't worry about it. They came, my friends came, my cousins came, family members from both my mother's side and dad's side pulled through, you know. Um, and luckily it turned out well. The, the, the event was um, well orchestrated, I have to say, and big ups to my mom and my relatives that helped put it together. I remember when I finally stepped out. I stayed in the bedroom the whole day, by the way. I didn't get to sit with my friends. Because you don't leave the room until the guy pays what they want him to pay. Right? So he was just not budging. The people who were representing him were not also complying with what was expected. And when I finally came out of the room, it was about to be sundown. So Rashapa stepped down the road there, you know, and... It still didn't click then that I'm married, I have to be honest. It clicked when I came back to Joburg and uh, 
and now we're living under the same roof as husband and wife before we're living under the same roof as girlfriend and boyfriend you know and now we are husband and wife and you know in my culture nevan laya they have to tell me monna mutrita like this and like this and obviously coming back to joburg after that lovely weekend i have to remember to treat him different now you know um he's a husband now um you must serve him his food he can't stand in the kitchen on his own you know um and and for me it was the submission that i struggled with you know uh, but i did try i gave it a, i gave it a, <laughs> why are you laughing <laughs> uh, why are you laughing the thing is i like i did try though i gave it my best shot i swear we went for marriage counseling that was my version of trying We went for marriage counseling. I kept it going for a while. Despite the challenges, I tried to make it work. The, for me, I feel like there wasn't so much of a process. You got married l- last week. Yeah. Actually, let me just say this. So there are three weeks, right? The week before you got married, you were a girlfriend. Mm. The week after you got married, you were a wife. Mm. That was so quick. Very quick. you organize everything just like that yeah and i wasn't just the wife now i'm i'm a wife and a pregnant mom to be again ah uh. <laughs> it was just <laughs> i think i'm going to i'm going to clarify this i i understand your confusion mm. let me clarify it for you you are right when you say it just everything happened so fast and it's in the way it happened so fast that i was also left in a haze I did not have time to recollect and decipher and observe the situation and say mara wait a minute I don't want this to ha- happen this way and I would I would say most of it I would blame it on um what I usually struggle with what I used to struggle with which is dysthymia dysthymia is functional depression you are depressed but you're still functioning but you're functioning on autopilot you're functioning on zombie mode if somebody says go there you go if somebody says pick up that cup you pick up that cup so that's that's dysthymia you can still go to work and work but you're depressed and it's it's dangerous in the sense that you're not present in the moment sometimes things happen to you and you don't even know they're happening to you you understand what i mean so like i like i always i never shy away from being honest with people that my marriage was never a fairy tale even in the girlfriend and boyfriend stage it was never a fairy tale the only reason i got married was because i'm pregnant and he wanted to marry me and i thought that this might be my last opportunity of having a life partner and do i really want to now go raise a second child without a dad again i'm on my second child with a different man and luckily this man wants to marry me unlike most men who want to run away but i knew very well that we had so many red flags between each other we had so many challenges even before we got married but i married to hope that things will change i married to hope that things will change and hence why i also tried to put in the necessary effort to make it work you see what i mean yeah after seeing the red flags Did you feel like obviously you had hope that everything is going to be okay? Do you feel like okay, from here we get married then we're going to have counseling. This man is actually going to be okay. We had we had counseling prior um but it was just marriage counseling from the church I went to. And um but you know his problem was not like something that could be fixed overnight, that's for sure. And uh it was something that would reoccur basically every weekend you know um and sometimes during the week you know he was uh, um an abuser who uh, would act out his abusive ac- episodes would come when he's under the influence and i wanted him i wanted to help him right and i wanted him to also be fixed hence why after getting married we opted for a professional marriage counselor and we were seeing a marriage counselor and that's where i learned that he's got deep rooted issues you know he's an angry man with a broken past 
that he never dealt with. And as much as I knew his past, I thought his past would make him a stronger person, hence why I can probably in the future rely on him as the pillar and the provider and the leader of our family, as the father figure I've always dreamt of. But he had deep-rooted issues. And I knew when we were taking therapy, professional therapy, that his problem is not going to be fixed today. First of all, he needs to accept it, rehab, because that's the first point of correction. Let's fix that. If we can fix that, then we can also fix the psychologically deep-rooted issues, you know? Because when you tell him what he did the next day, he doesn't remember. He doesn't remember. And he would cry and say, I'm so sorry, I can't believe I did that. What is wrong with me? You know, so this is somebody who would go from praying with you to wanting to kill you in one day. Because in between these drinking, and I don't even know if it was just drinking, maybe there were other substances involved, but I wasn't aware. But the way he would lose his mind and not remember anything that he does, I remember feeling scared that this is the kind of person who would kill me. And then in court, he would blame it on, I was not in the right space of mind, you know? And they would blame it on uh, dementia or something, or amnesia, alcohol amnesia, I don't know. But I remember thinking, I don't want to be a failure at a marriage. I don't want to be looked at like that. Let me try and make this work. But I was making it work at the expense of um, hurting and destroying my oldest daughter psychologically because yeah. she's experiencing this with me. We live in the same household. She's, he, she's hearing him call me all sorts of names when he's intoxicated. And then she has to come and ask me, what did that word mean? She's seeing him shopping knives and say, She is seeing him, you know, break uh, glasses. She is seeing him want to break down the butler door. So she's seeing all of this and she's terrified of this man to the point where every time he came home from work, she would go to her bedroom. And then we started a habit of locking ourselves in the bedroom when he's home especially if he's home intoxicated, because we know how things can go south very quickly. I grew up in a family whereby my dad used to do similar stuff. No. Oh. And today that I'm married, um, the stuff that happened back then, um, the trauma came back after more than 20 years. Mm. And I didn't know what was happening to me. So every time when I would sleep and it's quiet, I would hear voices of my mom and dad fight. And I couldn't understand. One thing I was grateful for is that I was not reacting in a negative way, in a way that I'm being physically abusive to my wife. And I was very much aware that there are men out there who have experienced the same thing and they do what their fathers did to their moms because they don't understand. They don't even understand what they, they are feeling or what's happening to them. I did ask myself what's really happening with myself, right? Until I actually found out that it's actually the traumas back then. Because mm. there was a day when I was young, my mom, my dad came back home and they were fighting. Um, my dad beat up my mom to a point whereby I couldn't take it anymore. My mom came to me and she found me shaking. And it's only now I realized that, oh, snap, that was the beginning of trauma, yeah. you know? Yeah. And when you're saying that, and I, I, I wanted to ask you that, when you look at his family, did you try see by any chance, maybe the problem could be here with his family, maybe would have his family did something back then to him. And now I'm the one who's eating the fruits. No, man. He didn't even come from a background of that nature. He lost his dad when he was six years old. He was raised by a single mom until he was 20 some, 22, 21. And He's the only boy amongst two girls, and he's the firstborn. And family members have detached themselves, so they were left to, to find a life on their own. You understand what I mean? So 
he does not have that kind of a traumatic past in terms of growing up in an abusive home. Um, hence why I didn't understand where his abusive nature comes from. But in his defense, I'd say he was an angry man. He is an angry man. He's angry at the world. He feels like it owes him something. Particularly what I mentioned that family members detached themselves. They literally had to find life on their own. You know what I mean? He had to find life on his own. And um, he's never really gotten much help, you know. So for me, I, I expected him to be somebody I can cry to about what I've been through. I expected him to be somebody I can cry to about the abusive relationships that I've been in prior to him. But like I said, his issue is really a deep-rooted psychological issue because when he's in his sober state, he's a loving, gentle, soft-spoken man, you know? And I remember thinking, even if I'm not sure about this marriage, but that character of his when he's sober, I love that character. You know, he's kind. He's a kind person. Everybody who's worked with him will tell you the same thing. You know, very humble, very respectful, very kind, very soft-spoken. But once he gets under the influence, he becomes a different human being. He becomes a monster that even he can't believe himself when you tell him, you know. I used to say it's my fault that he's abusive because I lack the ability to submit to him. Maybe I'm not respecting him enough. Right? Because I also know that I don't know how to respect a man because I've never had a father figure to respect. The father figure that was modeled before me is not somebody who deserves respect, you know? And even if, even in times when I tried to, 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 to reach out to him, to gain his love and respect him so that I can gain his love in return, I never received it. So I don't have much hope in. In, in, in a man, a uh, man being a pillar for me to lean on or a shoulder to cry on or a provider or, you know, it's just, I don't know, I've never seen myself respecting a man in a way a woman should. And I've been told more than once that when I'm in that department, you know, yeah, yeah. and it's something I'm learning to do. And the reason I'm learning to do it is because I have kids that look up to me and I have to model, I'm modeling a, a, a proper woman in front of them, right? So the, the main figures that I have in my life and the main figures that are in their lives are my brothers. And as much as my brothers are younger than me, I still treat them with respect. I, it's intentional. I literally have to remind myself to treat them with respect because guess what, that little girl is watching me and looking at me how I treat my brother, even if he's my younger brother, you know, how I treat my younger brother would also teach them how to have respect, you know, for the male figure and just respect in general for society. Um, because as much as I, I want to be angry uh, with the world and men in general because of what I've experienced with the, the different gender, um, gender. I cannot be so angry that I taint the way they will be relating with their future husbands, their future partners, their future colleagues. You know what I mean? I, I don't want that cycle to carry on. So I have to be intentional with how I treat men. So much so that even when I'm in an Uber ride with them, I call the Uber driver, sir. And this is what they mean by children do as you do, not as you say. Today, if my daughter walks in here and greets you, she will say hello, sir. I didn't have to teach her that. She just saw me doing that. Do you understand what I mean? So, but um, anyway, just to quickly conclude um, the issue with my ex-husband is that when he finally left, I, we didn't maintain any communication, but when I pray, I do put him in my prayers that he can heal because I know there's a good person in him. There's a good person there. I've seen that person. That's the person I was hoping to marry, you know, but unfortunately I saw the monster more than I saw the good person. And I'm hoping wherever he is, he's healing. 
I'm hoping wherever he is, he can find um, a way to deal with the trauma that he has as well, you know. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that he can heal so much that he can finally have a relationship with his daughter one day. When you guys separated, were you, did you already give birth or was? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I had already given birth. Uh, my daughter was like one month. Okay. Yeah. How okay. hectic was it? Because there's a, a bit of some stories on the internet. Saying, you lie. What yeah. did you hear on the internet? Well, you died for three days. Well, not three days. What three days, I wouldn't be here. I'm not <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you died for three minutes. Mm -hmm. Three minutes is good to warm up food yeah. in the microwave. Yeah. But for somebody to die for three minutes, that's a lot of time. It is. It's enough time for the doctor to walk to my mom and say, your daughter is dead. And my mom says, no way, go back. Go back and try and wake her up, do whatever it takes. That's how long it was, you know. Um, he wasn't there. When I went to give birth, he was already living outside of the house. He was already kicked out. And um, I mean, even in the short space of time we were married, literally every month he was out. I would kick him out. I, I guess that's the tough cookie in me. I'm like, I ain't gonna handle this. And also, I'll have to be honest, I'm not the kind of woman who you would hit and then I go, ah, no. I was fighting back. I was physical with him as well. I didn't allow him to beat me and throw me down the stairs and I just watch him and no. We must remember I grew up watching that. So I'm tough enough to fight for myself. I will fight you too. You know, obviously I would run away if tools came into the picture like knives and stuff and broken glasses. That's when I run away, you know. But um, well, every time we'd have a fight and I feel like, no man, this is damaging my daughter. Please go. Please go and sort yourself out and come back when you've sorted yourself out. And luckily he would always come back whenever there was a family mediation. You know, my mom comes through and there's that, uh, you know, meeting and then they mediate for him and he uh, um, apologizes and says he'll find help. But, but, but when I was going to give birth, he had been out of the house for a good two months or three months or so. In my last trimester of pregnancy, he was not living with us anymore. And then I went to the hospital and there was that near-death experience situation, dying experience and coming back. Upon returning, the first month that we were back home, um, I didn't have much help. It's me and my infant child who I need, who needs special attention because she had complications at birth. I'm also trying to heal from the, the birth situation. And uh, I felt under severe depression and I had anxiety. I couldn't sleep at night because I thought I won't wake up. What if I, I die again? So I was a mess. <laughs> yeah. And um, I remember he offered, let me come back home and help you take care of the little one. No, no, you're not coping. I'm your husband. I'm still your husband. Let me come back and help you. You can't be so stubborn. I promise I'm a different person. I've changed. And, you know, to the disappointment of my oldest daughter, I said, okay, I do need the help, especially financially, because he was the breadwinner. He was the only one working. And he came back, but he only came back, I'm sure, about three months, and then that was it. The, he, we had a final straw that was my scariest moment. And that's the moment, the only moment I ever recorded. Because I've never recorded him in his episodes. So other people would never believe me when I told them what he did. When I was confiding in certain people. They would never believe him because of his humble, soft-spoken stature. And I'm this loud, vocal girl. So they all think, ah, it's, it's you. It's probably something you did. You know what I mean? So I finally recorded him so they can finally see that it's not what I did, guys. He really is an abuser. He really did this. And that was the final straw on a camel's back because that day I thought I was going to die. I thought he's killing me. I thought if he's killing me, can the world at least know how I died? So there's no backstory. There's no assumptions. They must just know how I died. And my kids must know as well. So I recorded him. But in the recording, as soon as I turn around, um, I find my oldest daughter, the youngest one was sleeping, but the oldest daughter is sitting in a corner, shaking and crying. 
and terrified. And that's when I knew that this can't go on. You mentioned that you realized that you were dealing with your trauma in, later in your adulthood, trauma that you picked up in childhood. I have the same situation. I grew up in a, a family where abuse was, was always there. And it was all types of abuse, you know, physical, verbal, financial, you know, psychological. And I'm only learning to deal with it now in my 30s. And if I allow this to, con to perpetuate, this child is also going to have to deal with the same thing I'm dealing with. So when are we ever going to cut it? When are we ever going to cut this cord of this vicious cycle? Somebody might say it stops with me and stopping it with you is not going to be easy. There will be consequences, but I was willing to take those consequences. You know, I was willing to have a failed marriage. I was willing to um, s struggle for a while financially. I was willing to start from scratch with nothing. I was willing to raise this child without his help because he was that angry. You know what I mean? Because my biggest mission was I've already messed up by marrying this person when I knew there were red flags, when I could have waited for things to be better. But I guess if there's one thing I can still fix is this child's mind and this child's memory. If I can fix that, I've done something right, you know? But I am not, I'm not in any way shameful that the marriage didn't last. I'm not. It's, if anything, I'm relieved because we, it was going to be a struggle. Oh, it was going to be a struggle. I knew that we were never going to reach three years there. I just knew we fought all the time, all the time. So with all the months put together, because it was on and off, on and off, I'd say we were married for nine months, but we never registered our marriage because it was customary, right? We never registered it. It never really got far. We, we never even changed surnames at all. Sure. It was never acknowledged by home affairs. So um, our parting ways was pretty much easy to do because we had no legal issues to sort out. So it was a matter of you go your way, I go my way. Don't call me if you need me because you're kicking me out. I'm like, it's okay, we won't call you. It's all right. After everything that has happened, how's your relationship with God? Oof. I don't know who said this in the in the Bible. I don't know if it's Paul. I don't know if it's David. I don't know if it's Joel. But it was one of them who said, it is good that I was afflicted because it drew me closer to God. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for I know thy rod and thy staff will protect me. A rod and a staff is a stick, right? When a shepherd is busy herding the sheep, he holds a stick to lead them in the right direction. If they go that way, his stick goes this way, and then they will all follow into that direction, right? But then when the, when the Bible says in that particular uh, uh, Psalms, thy rod and thy staff will protect me, it's not necessarily meaning that Whatever evil comes your way, God will smite it with his rod and staff. No. If a sheep walks astray, a shepherd breaks one leg of the sheep, so it starts limping. And if a, and if a sheep is limping, it will never walk astray again. Because if you walk astray, the wolves will catch you and eat you, right, as a sheep. But if you're limping, you stick next to your shepherd because you're afraid that if a wolf comes, you won't run away, Right? So with me narrating that story, I'm trying to say that I went through challenging times, you know, a marriage that fell apart, a near-death experience. My health was in shambles, and I felt like my life might as well end. I used to ask God, why did you let me live? Why didn't you just let me die in that hospital that day? Because look at me now, I'm a mess. I'm an emotional mess. I'm a physical health mess. I'm a social mess. My life 
is upside down. I have nothing to live for besides this child who's who's here now, who I can't even raise because financially it's a strain, you know. So at one point I felt like there's nothing to live for. But it was in those moments that I drew closer to God because I was limping. Some part of me was broken. Some part of me had been sprained, you know. I was walking with a limp. And I drew closer to God because I knew very well that I was never going to make it without God. That has always been my way out of life. I don't know any other way. I don't know any plans. I don't know who to run to. I don't know what scam to do. I don't know which nyanga to visit. I've never known any other way when I am in a dark place but to run to God. So it was in those quiet days of depression in those isolated moments of loneliness and despair and fear that I'm going to die in my sleep. When I couldn't find anybody on the phone to talk to and I had panic attacks and I was hyperventilating and I'm looking at a child on the bed and I'm thinking, I better not die. What is is this child going to do? That I just called upon God and I said, do you remember me? As your child, do you remember me? And... God remembered me and said, but I never left you, Nolo. You left me. You walked astray. You did things in your own intellect and your own understanding without consulting me. So you did life without consulting me. And it didn't work out well, but I'm still here. I'm still here for you. And I didn't only run back to God, but I was corrected. So it was in the healing, because I knew I was broken in many many areas. God took me, comforted me, and said, now I'm going to start fixing you, Nolo. And because you're alone and you're isolated, it's the best time for for me to work on you because there are no noises outside. And for some reason, that time of my life, nobody was there for me. Friends were not at close proximity. I wasn't getting phone calls. My phone would not ring for three days. And I thought, what is happening? But God needed me to be alone. God needed me to be isolated, to shut down the noise from outside and hear him and hear him alone. So he can fix me and say, Nolo, you know, this part of your life, you lost it. Figure it out. Here, you were walking astray, my child. Come back to me. This part, yes, the damage is already done, but you can cut the spiritual tie that you did You can pray about it and fast about it and cut it in the spiritual realm. It does not need to haunt you forever. You don't need to carry this burden forever. I can create you to be a new person. All things can be passed away. Your past mistakes can be forgotten by me, maybe not by the world, but by me. And you won't have to live with that shame and that guilt. So I not only got healed, but I also grew into a different person. I grew into a different person and I managed to raise that child. I managed to raise those two kids on my own with the help of God and not with a permanent job. I'd get jobs here and there. I'd get assistance, financial assistance from my mom, but I didn't have enough, but we survived because Jaira, Jehovah Jaira provided. I remember at one point saying, oh my goodness, Heavenly Father, what am I going to do in our industry when you're out of sight, you're out of mind? If you're not seen on screen for a while, people forget about you. Does that mean I have to start looking for a job in the sector of psychology? What am I going to do? I won't be able to just walk back into the industry and get something right away. And you know what my God said? My God said, with you, out of sight and out of mind does not apply. Because every job you've ever gotten in this industry always found you. You've never had to chase. It always came to you. So you can't be the one worried right now. Relax. I'm working on you. There are things I need to fix in you. Your broken parts need to be put together again. In the meantime, focus on the process. When it's time, I will put you back on that platform and I will accelerate you. 
and my God did accelerate me because I also got the idea of finishing my book in that season of being alone and being close to God and leaning on him and hanging on his every word like it's oxygen. That's what sustained me. And I managed to write a book that is so impactful that to this day I read it and I'm like, damn, I wrote that, you know, because everything was spirit led. Everything is honest. Everything is raw. And I wasn't writing it to, 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 to be popular again. I was writing it for my healing. And then I remember one day God said, okay, remember those pages you were writing every time you and I would have our conversations, put together those pages, theme them and put together a book. Because if you could heal from this and become the person that you are today, who's barely recognizable from the person you used to be, then it will help somebody else. And that's how the book came to, to life. You know, but if there's one thing I can tell you is that you do not have a near-death experience and remain the same. There's no way. There's no way. Something about you has to change. And something about me did change. If anything, I just discovered who I really am. And maybe I was sleeping on myself for the longest of time, you know. So, um, yeah, my relationship with God is pretty cool. You know, we sit together. <laughs> yeah. We chill. We, you know, yeah, sometimes I'm like, when I pray, I always ask Jesus companionship during the day. And what I mean by that, I always say, you know, throw it back at me. You know, when I bounce an idea, throw it back at me. You know, I, I want to feel your presence everywhere I go. You know, um, on lonely nights, like I become literal about everything. On lonely nights when I'm like, Joe, and I don't have a person, and I'm single, I'd feel Jesus' companionship where I can have deep conversations with in Jesus and not feel like I'm alone or I'm lonely. Because you can't speak to kids about deep stuff, you know. My kids can't always hear me talking about deep things. They won't even understand. So sometimes when I'm longing for that connection and deep-rooted conversations, I just go grab a cup of tea, sit in my living room in the dark even. You know, I don't have to put on the lights. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to talk to you about this particular thing. What do you think I should do? That's how casual I am. I don't have to put a scarf over my head and kneel and, and, and you know, recite to sit in. No, I just call upon God in Jesus' name and really just talk casually like I'm sitting with you right now. And then I sit in silence and wait to hear what God says. So I am so dependent on God right now that I don't feel comfortable doing anything without consulting God first anymore. You know? Your story is so inspiring. It is? Yeah, it is. Yeah, just, that is just one nope. other. <laughs> it's just another story. No, 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 no. I think for those who... I'm sure they they want to know the full story. I, I'm sure they need to go through the book. Oh, yeah. yeah. How, oh, yeah. How do people get the book? Okay, so at the moment, I'm selling the book in my own capacity. Okay. I'm hoping very soon that it's going to be on take a lot so that they can deal with the logistics of delivery. I did not know that was going to be so challenging. Yeah, yeah. But right now, if you want to get the book, just go into my Instagram. Unfortunately, that's the only medium that I use. Um, for those who know me personally, obviously, they know where to find me. But um, for those who don't, just go to my Instagram. It's a public uh, profile. And uh, there's an email link there. So you just send an email. We'll send you banking details. And you will uh, revert back with your um, address where we should deliver the book to you. You know, there's so much peace in knowing yourself and so much power in self-awareness. Um, you deal with the challenges of life differently. You don't get easily frustrated and anxious. I ah, no, now I'm very chilled. You know, I deal with adversity in a chilled manner. I'm like, okay, I see, but I know what I have. I know what I possess, and I know how I can tackle this, you know. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting me speak so freely. Yeah. <laughs>